Today we're talking about current. This is something that is familiar to you at GCSE. And while you may understand what current is, the level of understanding, the depth of understanding that you need at A level is greater. So I'm going to go back to basics. I'm going to talk you through it. And then if you have any questions, please do ask anything you need to in the comment box below. We need to fundamentally understand what we mean by charge. So back at GCSE, we know that we can charge an object by rubbing it if it's an insulator or by connecting it to another charged object. And the key thing here is that we are moving electrons from one place to another. So if you move electrons off an object when you charge it by rubbing, then that object is left with an overall positive charge. And if you add electrons to an object, it gains a negative charge. Fair enough, that's straightforward. But the basis of all of DC circuits is electrons, so we need to understand what we're talking about. So when we use the word charge, we are usually referring in DC circuits to electrons, although oftentimes we will use the more general charge carriers, because there are situations like electrolysis where current might be caused by the movement of positive ions. So just so we're managing all situations or able to refer to all situations, we call them charge carriers instead. And the quantity charge, which effectively is number of electrons, is given this symbol Q. When we talk about circuits and we're talking about the movement of electrons in circuits, we do not count electrons individually. The charge on an electron is way too small to count individually how many electrons might pass in a, at a particular time. So instead, we count them in units called coulombs. And there are this many electrons in a coulomb. A coulomb is a small but manageable amount of charge, and so it becomes easy to count for most practical circuits. If you know that there are this many electrons in a coulomb, then you should be able to calculate what the charge on each electron is. So 6.25 times 10 to the 18 electrons per coulomb, that means 1 over that is going to give you the charge on an electron. That is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. This is a fundamental constant that you will need to use. It's in the data book, so you don't have to remember it, but to be honest, you're going to be using it so often over the next couple of years that you're probably going to remember it is given the symbol Q or sometimes E in our data booklet to signify electronic charge. Now, because it's the charge on an electron, it should be negative. And of course, we know that the relative charge of an electron and a proton, that is their comparative charge, is one, which means that a proton will also have this much charge, except it will be positive. So our electron and proton have the same amount of charge. Now we start getting to the real circuit stuff and the idea of current. Now we know from GCSE that the definition of current is the rate of flow of charge. And at GCSE, we usually talked about current being about the speed of the electrons, because that's the easiest way to think about it. You get more current if the electrons are going faster around the circuit, and when we measure current, we're measuring how fast the electrons travel. That isn't really the full story, though. It is one half of the story, because current is not just how fast the charge is moving, but also how much. As you'll have known from GCSE, it's given the symbol I and is measured in amps. But when we talk about the rate of flow of charge, there are two ways that you can increase the rate of flow of charge. So you imagine that as the electrons, the charge carriers, are passing a point in the circuit, you're counting how many charge carriers you get per second. So the number of coulombs of electrons that pass a point in one second. Obviously, the faster those coulombs are going, then the more we're going to get in one second. But there's another way of getting more coulombs per second. They could go at the same speed, you just have more of them. So you use a material that might have more available electrons. And this is where, at A level, we start to dig down a little bit into more about the material that is carrying the current. Equations you need to know, rate of flow of charge, I is equal to, usually just expressed as Q over T, but the rate of flow, so it's delta Q over delta T. We also know that we measure current using an ammeter, and the ammeter has to be connected in series. Usually, so with certain ammeters anyway, you have to make sure that it's connected in the right way round. So the positive, the red 
port on the ammeter is connected to the red port on your power supply or the positive of your battery. Usually, nowadays, that doesn't matter. You won't blow the ammeter by doing that, but you will get a negative number, which you can just ignore. But you do need to be aware that if you get a negative number, it means that your ammeter is connected in the wrong way around. One thing that's very important, very important, is that we know that electrons flow from the negative side of the battery round the circuit to the positive side. And we'll get to more about that when we talk about voltage. The problem is that current as a concept was discovered in the late 1700s, I think. But the electron wasn't discovered until 1899, which means they had already decided that current flowed from positive to negative back in the 1700s. And by 1899, when they discovered the electron, they decided that it was too late to change all of the diagrams they'd previously drawn. So they just decided to leave it. Leave it as flowing from positive to negative. And that is what we call conventional current. Now, most of the time, it doesn't actually matter. But you do have to be careful when applying certain rules to circuits that you make sure that you are always calculating current as passing from positive to negative. To demonstrate what happens in a circuit, I'm using the very wonderful FET simulation from the University of Colorado. I will put a link in the description box so that if you want to play with the simulations, and there are loads of them for all sorts of physics, maths, chemistry, biology, then you can do. You can see I've set up a very straightforward circuit here. I've got my battery up here. Uh, a resistor, and I've got a, a light bulb, a filament lamp, all in series, and we can see the electrons traveling from the negative end of the battery round the circuit. If I take an ammeter, one of the most fundamental laws, again, that you learned at GCSE, is that it doesn't matter where you put the ammeter in this circuit, you are going to get the same current all the way around because current is not used up in a circuit. It is the delivery mechanism for the energy in the circuit. So all you are doing as you put your little bullseye here is you are counting the number of coulombs that pass that bullseye per second. And we can see we've got 0.45 coulombs. If I up the voltage a bit, you can see that the coulombs are moving faster around the circuit. If I keep increasing that, you can see our electrons are moving faster through. That is giving us a greater current. Remember, though, of course, that this is showing us the actual electron movement. If we want to look at conventional current, we have to draw the current as going from the positive end of the battery round to the negative end. That's series circuits. Current is the same at all points on a series circuit. What about if you put in some parallel branches? So let me just add a resistor just the single resistor in parallel here and see what happens to our current. Let me just put this up here. We've still got 0.45. And you'll notice that as soon as I add in a parallel branch, the current actually increases in the main part of the circuit. If I put this down here, we've still got 0.45. So we say that that resistor, that loop, the resistor and bulb combination are drawing 0.45 amps. But of course, energy has to be supplied to the resistor at the bottom as well. So that one draws 0.9 amps. And because the battery is going to have to supply all those coulombs, you have to add those two together to get to the total current that is passing through the battery, which is 0.45 and 0.9, giving us 1.35. This illustrates the other particular law about current is that while current is the same at all points on a series circuit, it divides at junctions in a parallel circuit. And it divides at junctions according to the resistance in that loop of the circuit. So if there's more resistance, it will get less current, and less resistance will get more current. So here we can see it's getting 0.9 amps. This is getting 0.45 amps. We can tell that this bottom loop has half the resistance of the top loop because it's getting twice the current. So that is the ratio. It's like an inverse ratio. And if, in fact, we click on our resistor, the resistor is 10 ohms. That resistor is 10 ohms. And the bulb is 10 ohms. So sure enough, the top loop has 20 ohms. The bottom loop has only got the one resistor, so 10 ohms. 
So the bottom loop has got half the resistance and double the current. What we just witnessed happening in that circuit is what is called Kirchhoff's first law. What I just said, that current is the same at all points on the series circuit and divides at junctions in a parallel circuit. And the fact that charge is always conserved is a fundamental part about Kirchhoff's first law. It's the charge that's conserved. So what goes in to a circuit has to come out the other side. It doesn't matter how many junctions or branches or loops that you have, the total has to be the same going into the battery as came out. Now, one of the extra little bits you need to know about current at A level is this idea of the difference between a conductor and an insulator. So now we knew at GCSE that one of the factors that affected how much current you would get through a particular piece of wire was the material that the wire was made of. We knew about the fact that some things were conductors and other things were insulators. But we never quantified it. It was never numerical. We just sort of went, oh yeah, that's a conductor, and oh yeah, that's an insulator. But actually, we now need to be able to quantify that and give it a number. And what distinguishes a conductor from an, an insulator is the number of what we call free electrons, or, again, charge carriers. And if you look at the numbers, you can see the difference between copper and plastic, for example, 1 times 10 to the 29 free electrons per meter cubed, because we count it per unit volume, as opposed to 1 times 10 to the 9 free electrons per meter cubed for plastic. We call this constant, this value, n, which is our charge carriers per meter cubed. So it has the unit per meter cubed. And this gives us an idea of the conductivity of the substance. And it tells us that plastic is an insulator, very few free electrons, not none, but very few relatively, and that copper is a conductor, and that silicon, which is a substance called a semiconductor, that we will get back to later, sits somewhere in the middle of those. We need to be able to understand how this charge carrier density, the number of free electrons per meter cubed, influences what happens with the current. So like I said, we've got our symbol N and its unit is per meter cubed. If we look at a piece of wire, so this is like a diagrammatic representation of charge, each charge being small q or electronic charge. So you can think of this as an electron moving with a velocity v down the wire. Let's remember that velocity v is meters per second. That's going to be important in a moment. Our current, because our negative charge is moving to the left here, our current has to be moving to the right, and the wire has a cross-sectional area of A. Let's think about what the volume of electrons passing in one second might be. Now, where are we going to get this from? Well, we know that volume is area times length. We don't know the length of this wire, but we do know that these electrons are completing V meters every second. So our length then becomes equal to the size of our velocity, but it'll be a length per second. And that will actually give us the volume per second. So volume per second is going to be equal to area times length per second. And of course, length per second is velocity. So we end up with the volume of electrons per second is our cross-sectional area times our velocity. So if we want to know the number, then, of electrons, we know the volume of electrons. If we want to know the number of the electrons, then we have to take that volume and multiply it by the number of electrons that would be in every meter cubed. So we know that n is the number per meter cubed. So if we multiply our volume of electrons every second by n, we'll know the number of electrons every second. We also know that current is the charge per second. So then if we have the number of electrons and we multiply that number of electrons by the charge of each electron, which we know is Q, then we end up with the charge per second, which is current. And this equation, also given in your data book, I is equal to NAQV. Remember, our N is our charge carrier to carriers per meter cubed. A is the cross-sectional area of the wire. Q is a constant. It's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, because that's what electronic charge is. And V is called our average drift 
velocity of the charge carriers or the electrons. And this, as a result, is called the drift velocity equation. What this does tell us is something more about current. We know that we can increase the current if we get the charge to go faster, if they've got an average drift velocity increase. But what this also tells us is that we can get the current to go faster if we just have more electrons available in the wire. If you use a material that has a higher charge carrier density. So both of these things will influence the speed of the electrons through a particular wire. We can do a quick calculation to look at a typical average drift velocity. The one thing you've got to be careful of is remember, you always need to have everything in standard units, SI units. So we need to change this 2.5 millimeters squared into meters squared. Now we know that there are 10 to the 3 millimeters in a meter. That means there are 10 to the 6 millimeters squared in a meter squared. So 2.5 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared is the same as 2.5 millimeters squared. So we want the average drift velocity with that current. We know that I is equal to NAQV. That means that V is equal to I over NAQ. And now we're just putting in our numbers. 5 divided by 1 times 10 to the 29. That's our N multiplied by our 2.5 times 10 to the minus 6. Multiplied by electronic charge, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. Do that sum, and you get 1.25 times 10 to the minus 4 meters per second, or 0 0.125 millimeters per second. The funny thing is that electrons don't actually move that quickly down along a wire. This is a typical average drift velocity. What you have to remember is that there are electrons packed along the wire, though, so as soon as you move one at one end, all of them get moved along. So it's often compared to balls in a tube. You pop a ball in one end of the tube, instantly a ball falls out the other end because all of the balls are touching each other in the middle of the tube. So the effect is instantaneous even if the electron's own movement themselves is quite slow. I hope you found this useful. Please let me know if you have any questions, and I will see you in the next video.